I wanted to talk about intercessory prayer. We didn't get to intercessory prayer. It was really important in the lesson today. Um, what is the purpose of intercessory prayer? I can tell you intercessory prayer. Um, boy, there's a whole section on the prayer here. Should we talk about intercessory prayer? Okay, so first, def- prayer. We have to go kind of quick. Prayer, conversation with God. What is the purpose of communication with God? If God already knows our thoughts before we even think them, what is the purpose? Is it to inform God of something he doesn't know? No. Then what's the point of prayer if he already knows? God says it is to enable us to receive it. To enable, he says enable us to receive it. Relationship and development. Relationship and development. Do parents sometimes already know what their children are going to say before their child says it? Have you ever, have you ever actually knew what they were going to say before they say it? Well, why is, is there any benefit for the child saying it to you? Even though you already know, is there any benefit in that? For the child actually saying it? And to speaking their thoughts, what is the benefit? Relationship and development. The child experiences the parent listening, the parent caring, the parent's concern, uh, gains knowledge of the parent who cares and loves them. This brings security and peace. And the child also develops in their ability to think, to communicate, to comprehend, to understand, to open, to be honest, to, to overcome fears, to overcome insecurities, to lay themselves bare before their parents and share their heart. There is a process of development in this. If the child asks the parent for something that the child is convinced is good for them, but the parent knows they are either not ready to handle or it would actually harm them, what does a loving parent do? Your child asks you for something and they're not not mature enough to handle it in your judgment or it's going to harm them. What's a loving parent do? Deny. Does the request of the child work to recreate love and interest in the heart of the parent? I didn't love you until you asked me, but now that you've asked me, now I've got love and interest. Is that what it does? Does it create love and interest? No. Of course not. But the child grows closer to the parent through the experience and learns more of the parent's values and characters. The parent says yes, says no, explains, sets boundaries, holds accountable. The child is learning about values and principles, aren't they? In that experience. What if the child has misconceptions about the parent and has developed a belief that the parent doesn't actually uh, love them, doesn't uh, grant their request, and, and isn't really interested in their well-being, and, 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 and says to the parent, if you don't give me what I want, I'm never going to speak to you again. What might a parent do in that case if the parent believed it was true? They were going to lose the connection with their child. Might the parent give them something and let them learn in the school of hard knocks? Well, what did God do when they insisted on the flesh pots of Egypt? He was giving them manna. They begged and begged for meat. So the quail came, and what happened? Thousands died. Uh, what, did they do when they, what did God do when they wanted kings? He warned and warned and warned against it, but and what happened after they, they learned? They learned a hard lesson. What did God do when they wanted to go to war rather than wait for the land to be abandoned? What did God do when they insisted on worshiping the Baals? He actually stepped back and let the Babylonians come. What did the father do in the story of the prodigal when the prodigal insisted on leaving home? Let him go. You know, we are like children who know so little of reality, including so little of God and his plans. Prayer is the process of coming into connection with the divine, of opening the heart and mind to the movement of the spirit, listening to what God has to tell us. And in so doing, we learn of him, come into contact with him, open ourselves to be enlightened, ennobled, and healed by him. In such a relationship, where we, send, we, we surrender ourselves in that trust relationship. Our burdens are lifted. Come unto me, all the labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Our guilt and shame is removed. Our fears are taken away. Um, a mind is enlightened. We see new possibilities new perspectives, new purposes. We have new goals. We come to love and cherish and value the things that we previously didn't love, didn't love and cherish. Our love for God increases and we, we willingly surrender to him and choose to follow him in fulfilling purposes we never even knew before. And then intercessory prayer, purpose of intercessory prayer is it to get God to, to act or care about some person he doesn't already care about. Is it to bring God's attention to something he doesn't know about? God, I know you're busy, but my friend over here needs a little help. Is it to change God's mind about something? To get God to be merciful when God would be less merciful if you weren't asking him? Here's, here's, uh, 
Here's an interesting quote. It's very, it's, I found this helpful to me in my own life many times. The conflicts of earth in the providence of God furnish the very training necessary to develop characters fit for the courts of heaven. We are to become members of the royal family, sons of God, and all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and submit themselves to his will. Our God is ever-present help in every time of need. He is perfectly acquainted with the most secret thoughts of our hearts and with all the interest and purpose of the soul. When we are in perplexity, even before we open to him our distress, he is making arrangements for our deliverance. And this is what I really like, this sentence. He always knows much better than we do just what is necessary for the good of his children, and he leads us as we would choose to be led if we could discern our own hearts and see our necessities and perils as God sees them. I've found a lot of comfort in that. That quote is found in Signs of the Times, May 25, 1888. And I've had that experience. If I could stand next to God's throne and see the end from the beginning and all the variables that he sees, I wouldn't choose different than he's choosing for me. That's very comforting. What about the intercessory prayer? And what about when you pray for somebody and it doesn't seem to be answered? When I was in my residency, one of my uh, colleagues' mother was dying of breast cancer. And she, prayed, she was very devout. She prayed for her mother's healing, but her mother died of breast cancer. Later she told me she initially w it was hard for her to understand until she realized that God was more merciful to her mother than she was. That she said God allowed her mother to pass beyond temptation, beyond more pain, beyond the disease, beyond suffering, and her mother will never feel pain again, never suffer again. But if her prayer had been answered the way she wanted it, her mother would still be on this earth and perhaps suffering under chemo or some treatment and still under the, the, the pains and, and ravages of this world. And that she had great peace realizing that God did answer her prayer by delivering her mother from all future suffering. Different perspective. Some may call this a rationalization. She just rationalized. But I believe it strikes a point. It reveals a point. God looks beyond our comprehension to realities that we're unaware of and takes all the multiplicities of possibility into consideration when answering our prayer. But there's one other aspect also of the intercessory prayer, and that's what Daniel brings, and that is this great controversy where, we, where he begins to pray and Gabriel comes that I was dispatched 21 days ago, but the prince of Persia was opposing me. And now the prince of Greece is coming. I've got to go back, and no one's there to help me except Michael, your, your, your prince. Now, who is the prince of Persia? No, it's not Satan. Satan is called the prince of this world. world. Is Persia the whole world or a portion of the world? So Satan's the prince of the whole world. This world of sin, this world of selfishness. If Satan's the prince of this whole world, then who would be a prince of Persia? One of, his angels. one of his minions. One of the fallen angels that works for Satan. Okay? And the prince of Greece is another uh, one of his minions. And so Gabriel comes from heaven to bring light and truth and principles of love and good desires and try to influence the heart of Cyrus. But the prince of, uh, of uh, Persia, you can imagine, is flaming up his fears. Oh, if you let those people go, they'll raise up an army and they'll overthrow your kingdom and flaming up all the fears to act selfishly not to do this. And, uh, and Gabriel is fighting with influence of truth and light and, and then and, and the lies and the fears are being flamed up. And he says, I've got to go back because the prince of Greece is coming to work against me. There's no one to help me except Michael. Now, according to most understanding, how many angels fell out of heaven? A third. That means there's two-thirds good ones left, right? So we have a two-to-one advantage in angelic host, good versus bad. How come there's only one angel to help Gabriel if we've got two-to-one advantage? Uh, what kind of war is this? It's cosmic, but is this a physical war? Is it a physical might war? We don't wage wars, the world does. The weapons we use are not worldly. They divide power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments, pretensions. It sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Okay? Now, Gabriel occupies what position in heaven, as far as we understand? Archangel who took the position of? Lucifer. Lucifer, right? So who's Satan now, right? So when Lucifer is kicked out of heaven, Gabriel takes the position. This is the position, as we understand, of the covering cherub, who is in the presence of God. So he is the position who has the closest knowledge of the truth of God's kingdom. 
If you understand the war is about bringing truth and light to bear on hearts and minds, there is no other created being in the universe that knows more of God's truth and light than Gabriel. There's no other angel that can add to what Gabriel can bring. So if we're going to have more truth of God, more truth of his character, more truth of his kingdom, then Gabriel knows who we're going to have to have. God himself. And so God, Jesus, in his pre-incarnate form, comes to add more light and more truth than what Gabriel can bring. And it wins the day. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are so amazed at the beauty of your character, how you've designed this world and this universe to run. Lord, we ask for the outpouring of the Spirit. Enable this message to go forth. Help us to repair the breach in your law so people will see you as the creator and the builder of reality. And we can evict this distortion of you out of the hearts and minds, cleansing our temples, and be rebuilt into a church, a beautiful, vibrant church that loves you and loves each other so the world can be enlightened and you can come soon. We pray in your holy name. Amen.